Greetings. Welcome to this uh, edition of Lessons in Leadership series. I'm honored to welcome uh, Bob Davis to this show. After graduating from uh, Northeastern in 1979, Bob has had an illustrious career in a variety of fields. And we are going to talk about uh, uh, his experiences and more importantly, his advice to the younger generation. Uh, he has had stints at uh, General Electric, Wang Labs, Lycos, and now he is general partner at Thailand Capital. Bob, it is fantastic to reconnect with you. Thank you for doing this for us. Oh, well, it's always wonderful to do all things Northeastern Raj, so it's my delight. Yeah, thank you. So I'm going to uh, start off with your uh, formative years, Bob. Uh, for the benefit of our viewers, uh, you gave what I thought was a rousing, inspirational, and more importantly, a moving commencement address to our uh, uh, graduates about a couple of years ago. And you talk a little bit about, about uh, growing up and the formative experiences that you had that actually shaped the professional that you are and the person you are. So could you talk a little bit about your childhood and, and the influences and uh, you know, for the benefit of our audience? Yeah, sure. So I grew up in uh, Boston's inner city neighborhood called Dorchester. It's uh, maybe a 12 minute ride from Northeastern today yeah. uh, and had a, uh, a you know, nice childhood, a loving family. And uh, but sadly, I lost each of my parents at a pretty young age. So my mom died when I was 13. My dad died at 20 while I was on a co-op assignment at Northeastern. So my world got turned upside down in a pretty rocky, pretty challenging way as a young kid. Uh, I didn't have any siblings that were living at home, so there I was uh, all by myself, commuting to Northeastern, living in an apartment in Dorchester, which had been the family home, and a two-story apartment, meaning you know two people in the same building. And and uh, there I was, didn't have any money, um, wow. struggled to struggled to pay for college. Wondered if I needed if I could even stay at university at that point in time because I didn't have the cash I needed. Uh, I was able to get. Um, number of work study assignments and picked up some, in addition to co-op, picked up some part-time jobs that helped me get by and really struggled my way through my final years at, at Northeastern to pay for an education. But it was a tough thing uh, emotionally for sure to do that. It's always tough to lose family members to care and love, love for. Right. But it was tough directionally because I was a little bit, bit of a lost boy in the woods that didn't really know where I wanted to be or where I wanted to go and didn't have uh, really any direction to turn back to. So that was part of where I was. And it, it's interesting, even the college experience to me was something that was an unknown. I mean, part of um, growing up, I mean, I, I have uh, three other siblings and two of us went to college. One was also at Northeastern, but it wasn't apparent in back in 1974 when I was right. graduating from high school that one would even attend college. My dad uh, discouraged me from attending. He thought I should take the Boston police exam, and which would be a nice, stable, long-lasting civil service career that would produce predictable income for my family and a right. stable, a stable job. And said, "Why don't I go be a cop?" Because at the time, I, I thought I wanted to study criminal justice. He said, "Hey, you want to be criminal justice? Do you have it? Save mm -hmm. all that money for tuition and, and go be a cop." So, so it was it was, it was tough, but but uh, here I am. Very uh, inspirational, Bob. In fact. Uh... I'm glad that you didn't take the police exam. I would have been talking to Sheriff Bob. But uh, let, let's talk a little bit about uh, your co-op experiences. You know, I'm, I'm sure, uh, uh, you know, uh, when, you, when we talk about co-op, you are an exemplary student. I, I think you graduated, what, sixth out of 900 students. So you were at the top of the class. You had... Uh, probably the pick of your uh, co-ops, et cetera. What made you pick IBM? And uh, why did you not choose to go into employment with IBM? It's funny you ask that, but there's a lot of, of peeling back the layers to give you a good answer to that. So, so you know, I, I look at a lot of who I am as you know, the loss of my parents, because it gives you a sense of drive and self-purpose and survival right. you might, other, might otherwise have. And, and, and I wouldn't wish that on anyone as a way right. to get that because um, it comes with a lot of burden. But but I, if I think back and I reflect, even before that, because when I was the the ten year old kid, I used to clip the coupons out of Boys Life magazine, which is a, a Cub Scouting magazine, and 
and, and find things to sell. And I'd stand in front of a local supermarkets and sell flower seeds or magazine subscriptions to earn uh, a couple of dollars is the way it was. And I always had these part-time jobs. And I was a great student at Northeastern, but I wasn't a great student at, in high school. I was an okay student when I went to uh, BC High, uh, uh, also in Dorchester. Right. And uh, just an okay student. I was average at best and I was a bit lazy, didn't study hard enough, didn't uh, come up to what I need to do, what I needed to need, do what I needed to do. And uh, it was when I got, went to Northeastern that somehow a light switch and I saw some really great students around me that were working hard and applying themselves. Not everyone, but plenty of folks right. were doing that. And, and I said, you know, I can do this. And then I went uh, on a tear and ended up as a straight A student for really every semester that I was at Northeastern, except for one where I uh, fell in love with my wife and ended up getting three Bs instead of all A's. So okay. that's where it was. But, but uh, back to um, the question of, of co-op, my uh, you know, co-op jobs take time. It's like everything else. Right. You have to grind, find the right one. Nothing's handed to you. Correct. This little platter for the co-op jobs, and you have to hustle. My uh, first co-op job, I was at criminal justice major, thinking maybe I want to be a lawyer. Wasn't sure which, but yeah. I had that angle and went to work, work for a lawyer at the state house. Um, so a, a, a person that worked in state government and said, you know, I, I don't like this work. It's, it's not what I thought right. it was about. And it, it put me on a different track. I came back after co-op and said, I want to transfer into business. And by the way, that was powerful for me. I mean, amazing, because if it weren't for the co-op job, I would have spent my five years at Northeastern, then another three years at law school. And eight years later, I would have found out that career wasn't for me. So Northeastern helped me there. Um, then I went off to my uh, first co-op job, I was working at the Foxborough Fox company, high tech, but working in a factory, feeling monotonous job, uh, great company, but didn't, wasn't really giving me all that much. And then uh, I heard about this role at IBM, that IBM was recruiting on campus for co-op. And um, I was, uh, after a lot of hustle and a bunch of interviews, um, I was told I'd hear from IBM on a particular day, and I didn't hear. I was crushed and just thought I didn't get the job, didn't get the call. And I remember sitting at home, just so disappointed and uh, getting ready for bed and not having this, this dream co-op assignment that I wanted. And then I uh, got a call from the recruiter at 10.30, 11 o'clock at night, apologetic for calling so late to say, hey, I have the job if you want it, but here's the catch is that we can't give it to you in the uh, semester that you want it. You'll have to switch uh, co-op schedules. Right. So uh, I had to make a hard decision because I had at that point my friends and my schedule and everything else. I had to now stay in school for the next semester where I should have been on co-op and take it a semester later, which I did. But it was you know a lot to go with that. It was great. I learned a lot. I met great peers and mentors. At the time, you know, it was in a sales role. I was an intern selling computers. It was really sexy. I mean. Computers that, that IBM was selling for a million dollars then, it was, I mean, it's your telephone today, yeah. computer power, but it was fun. It was really exciting, great time in, in the world of technology, and it was just amazing. And I did that for my remaining semesters, I think two or three remaining semesters, I went to IBM each time. Wow. And then uh, uh, your first uh, job out of Northeastern was at GE, correct? That's right. Yeah. And that, and that was interesting. Uh, IBM, I, I wanted to go to IBM. But um, a problem I wish I, I wish I had today, they told me I had a baby face. Wow. <laughs> and I, I would be look too young to sell computers. Yeah. So they wanted me to become an, an engineer. And I said, it's not what I want to do. Nothing wrong with that, but it's yeah. not what yeah. I want to do. So I, I didn't go to IBM. And I uh, had other offers coming out of Northeastern, which are great. But I decided now I'm going to think about this a little bit. And, took the summer off, went up to the West Coast with some friends and just kind of did some soul searching and, and came back. And then uh, through a newspaper ad, found a job selling communications equipment for General Electric. Uh, the General Electric Data Communications Product Business Department. There's a mouthful. Grew wow. out of Waynesboro, Virginia. And I, I sold for them. And it was a, did that for two and a half years. Really great career. and Built one of my really lifelong mentors there. It was a good experience. Yes. And in fact, uh, two things strike me about you, Bob, and I'm going to, uh, one, you caught the wave of technology much before anybody uh, understood the power of technology. And that has, you know, 
that has been your arc, if you will. But the second thing is, you and I have talked about it, the power of mentors and the power of mentorship. And uh, you were a willing receiver of advice. And, and I, I'm, am I correct in saying your next switch to Wang Labs happened because of a friend uh, slash mentor for you? Oh, it happened entirely because of the Northeastern Co-op program, if, you, if I call it accurately. Right. There was a, a person that I got to know that was a salesman at IBM while I was a co-op. And he was just a great guy. Uh, uh, he took a uh, just a liking to me. I took a liking to him. In fact, in the book that I wrote, yeah. I give him a, he and another of my mentors credit right up front because of what they did for me. His career developed, he went off to become a manager at Wang Lab, which is, most won't know that company today, but it was a high flying technology Correct. company in, in its day, you know, 30,000 employees or thereabouts. So good, good sized company and, and doing quite well. He called me and said, hey, there's a, an opening here down in Rhode Island to be a salesman. Why don't you leave GE and come over and join us? And one thing led to another and I went down to uh, that role and sold for, um, Wang did really well there. I became in the division that I was in, became the number one salesman in the country. And that led to a great career at Wang at a time when computers were just high flying. Wow. And uh, at this point in time, Bob, one of the things that I wanted to ask you is you decide to go and do a, an MBA at Babson. You have a, what I think is a, a promising start to a career with GE and Wang Labs. And you're doing extraordinarily well and uh, you decide to supplement this with uh, an MBA. What prompted that decision for you to go to Babson and do an MBA? Well, you know, one of the things that they instilled in us at BC High was uh, love to learn, that they may, that they may learn. And it was learning became uh, really exciting to me. And I was a believer of that uh, and I, I really, tried to inspire my kids with the same philosophy that the more education we can capture, just the, the better we are at so many levels, the better people we are, the, the more informed we are, the more we can assist and help in so many different ways. So I, I wanted that degree. And I also wanted the network that comes with that, people that I could meet and know and, and, and be, become part of who I am. Uh, although quite honestly, if I, if I look back on that, I would have done it very differently. Uh, I, I believed in that power of learning, but again, I didn't have any money either. So I, I've got my MBA at night and that was good. I'm glad I had the MBA, but it wasn't the MBA experience that I wanted. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Right. There's thousands of students that will get it in evenings and part-time programs because they need to, or they want to, for whatever reasons, it's okay. But for me, if I have a regret on that, and I don't have many regrets in life, but I wish I had um, done that in a, a day program somewhere and just been part of a more uh, total experience. Yeah, and, and I um, I hadn't um, done that. Yeah. But even, you know, back back to Wang, by the way, and this speaks to a lot of things. I was at Wang in the early days when technology was crazy successful. I mean, it was just, you know, powerful what was happening. Yeah. But I was also at, at Wang when the personal computer revolution yes. came along. And we had something known as the Massachusetts Miracle that was back and it was out on Route 28. All of the high technology companies were existed and it was the envy of the nation. It was really the Silicon Valley of the 1980s with all these tech companies out there before anyone was talking about Silicon Valley. Right. And there was a slew of companies and they were all making what are called mini computers. It's, it's a long description of what they are, but we, we all did that back then. And the, the personal computer came along yeah. and all these companies ran into trouble yeah. because the personal computer took over everything. And one by one, they were sold, they disappeared. And I was at Wang. Uh, in a uh, six, uh, sales management role at the time, not the leading sales management role, in a sales management role, and the company went bankrupt. Yeah. Uh, so I was there as the company filed for bankruptcy, and I had the unenviable role. Wang has something which they call their Achievers Club. It takes place once a year for the salespeople that meet their expectations and their quotas, and that was taking place in Hawaii. And uh, I was assigned by the CEO of Wang because of the filing for bankruptcy the leadership team at Wang now could not go to this sales conference. And they, they picked me to let me know a couple of days in advance about the impending bankruptcy. The morning that the salespeople were arriving uh, into Hawaii, they received an envelope under their door 
that informed them that the company was bankrupt. It could not be a more nightmarish scenario. So everyone wakes up on the sales trip that says, we just filed for bankruptcy. And I was given the job to stand in front of 3,000 people and, and give a rousing, uplifting speech. It, it, the title of the speech is, don't forget how good we really are. And that was just a, a crazy time, but it's always a grind. And we can't forget, in my opinion, that life is a grind and it, it's how we battle through it that's most important. Yes, and uh, one of the uh, very interesting things uh, for me, Bob, as I am looking at your uh, career, and you highlighted it so beautifully with the transition from mainframe to mini computers to PC. A lot of firms fell by the wayside. And when I think about your, uh, uh, you know, uh, experiences, etc., you have always believed that there is no dominance by birthright. You need to hustle, which is uh, exemplified in your "you let up, you lose" philosophy, which I'll get to later. Now I want to transition to what uh, I personally think. Uh, was a signature uh, achievement of yours when you went to Lycos. You know, that's how I got to know the Bob Davis, you know, because as you know, I did the history of uh, computers and so on. So I want to place uh, in context for the viewers. We are now sitting a couple of decades uh, into the 21st century, so we don't uh, understand the mid 1990s, et cetera. When you joined Lycos, a uh, very nascent industry, you were still slightly later than, than other entrants. And, and there was, it was a nascent industry, there was no business model, and you were responsible for coming up with a business model. So could you talk to us a little bit about your mindset, Bob, how you approach this problem in a, in a, uh, a regime that is uh, completely uncertain? So how did you how did you navigate this terrain? Well, yeah, it was it was a big risk. Uh, the internet barely existed. Uh, okay. it, it's hard to imagine this, as you point here in the 21st century. But at that point in time, the vast majority of the population hadn't heard of the internet. Right. Never mind used it. It was a it was a vehicle that was used by academia and, yes. and defense and research, and, and that was it. And we had things like America Online that were coming in, into popularity, but it wasn't out there. And um, I, uh, with another individual, heard about this search engine technology. Uh, we acquired that technology from a brilliant computer scientist down at Carnegie Mellon University. Mm -hmm. And I had this spaghetti software code, a bunch of lines of code. And I woke up one day as the, the only employee of this company trying to turn this search technology and search. Like us, people won't know it today, but it was Google before Google existed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and said, try to turn this into a business. And I, I at that point, had a couple of kids and uh, <laughs> a lot of bills and responsibility, had a little money at that point, and, but said, I'm gonna leave it behind and go start this company called Lycos. And yes. woke up, sitting in a cubicle and said, let's go to it and start this company. Yeah. And uh, could you talk a little bit about the business model, Bob? Because I remember reading about, uh, uh, a media company kind of search engine, right? So, I mean, obviously there's much more nuance to it. Could you talk about the business model, how you envisioned it? And of course, uh, you were the fastest to the IPO. So could you talk a little bit about that journey? Yeah, it, it's interesting. Back, back in 1995, not many people understood what a search engine is. It, it was, and no one used one. It, right. it was my thesis that you, you think of the internet at the time as this world's largest card catalog. Think of the Library of Congress card catalog times 100,000, except there's an earthquake and all the cards fall on the floor and, and you don't know where anything is and it's all scattered. And how do you find your way through it? Well, a search engine is what lets you find your way through that card catalog of the intent. A lot of fancy technology behind the scenes that, that does that, but that, that's what it did, did, did for us. And, uh, you know, we looked at that and said, but, you know, what's the business model? And it wasn't clear to us. Uh, and as we started to grow, we had some venture capital money, but it wasn't, it wasn't clear what we were gonna do. And, and for a bit, we, we sold software. So we sold our search technology to major corporations that would search their own databases. So we had a public consumer facing search technology where you could search the web. We had a whole bunch of different angles, things that we were doing, but we didn't know what we were. And I would say um, we weren't courageous at the time, because we were afraid to pick one area and say, just do it. And 
one of the things I've learned over my lifetime is to be successful, you have to be great at what you're good at. And we were good at a lot of things, on the, but not necessarily great at anything at that point in time. And we, 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 comp, we uh, called ourselves a technomedia company, which is a cop up. I mean, it meant nothing. It says, oh, we're technology, we'll license software, we're a media company, we'll sell ads, what are we? And then we woke up about a, a year into our journey and we, we knew we were confused. We had a big management offsite and said, hey, let, let, we, need to, we need to go for this. We need, to, we need to go get it. And let's stop all this licensing of technology. Let's just say what we're all about. We're a consumer facing uh, product that helps people search the web. And the way we're gonna make our living is by selling advertisements to large corporations. I remember the first ad we took it was to AT&T for a whopping $5,000. But that became the path that we had and, and it wasn't clear. I mean, there were, we might have been one of a half a dozen companies in the world that had taken ads for anything online. And nobody was buying ads, no one was selling ads. And, mm -hmm. and that's where we were and that's what built the company. Wow. So now suit does come calling to you and uh, uh, you actually, uh, uh, made a sale, like was did get acquired by Telefonica. Could you talk about that journey? Because I read uh, that USA Networks was interested in you and, uh, and uh, but finally you made the sale to Telefonica. How did that yeah. happen? What was that journey? Yeah, it's interesting. We were a, uh, well, we were a publicly traded company mm -hmm. and um, for quite some time, we were a successful publicly traded company. We beat, yeah. we beat Wall Street estimates for 19 consecutive quarters. Never missed, it's as long as we were a public company. But uh, this was now back in 2000, and you know this, the internet roads were getting rocky. Right. Uh, the euphoria that existed in the marketplace was becoming right. a little more skeptical, and we had a valuation that seemed pretty down high for me in terms of the company. And uh, we always had a lot of interest in acquirers, but at this point in time, I said, maybe it's time to stop listening. At the time, uh, Barry Dilla, who was the, uh, right. today the chairman of, of IAC Networks, but then, founder of Fox Networks and a lot of other things. Um, um, he had a, was the CEO and chairman of USA Network, which owned a lot of assets, right. uh, including the Home Shopping Network, Ticketmaster, Expedia, a whole bunch of things. He wanted to acquire Lycos and merge us in to all of his assets that he had, and Lycos would run all those assets, except for the TV studios, Guarded. which he owned a number of TV studios. And it was exciting to me and we looked to do it. We said we'd do it. We signed a merger agreement and we announced it publicly that we're gonna merge with, with uh, USA Networks. We had other suitors, NBC, tried to acquire us at the time, um, many others. And we said, we'll, we'll do this. But it was interesting, we misjudged the market in the sense that the market wasn't as excited about this merger as we were. And to, they thought there were internet diamonds and we were buying into Home Shopping Network's Kubrick Zirconia and said, right. you know, we don't know if this makes sense. And we had a large shareholder that was on our board that um, uh, worked in opposition to the transaction after we announced it. And we just couldn't get it done. We, we withdrew from the transaction and moved on. We ran as an independent company for another year or so. Uh, I didn't believe that the markets were any rosier at that point in time. In fact, they became more unstable. And we were approached by uh, Telefonica. A lot, it's a equivalent of Verizon for the Latin world. They're in Spain, but they dominate in most of the um, Spanish speaking world um, in terms of product phone services at the time. They made us a compelling offer. We merged in with them, became known as, we merged into their internet subsidiary, became known as Terra Lycos, uh, peaked at about a $30 billion market cap. Uh, I was the CEO of that combined entity for a little while. And, but after I did that for a bit, I said, you know, this is not my company anymore. This is not what I, this is not what I built. And, and I didn't necessarily share the views of my acquirers. We were successful at Lycos because we had been very acquisitive. We, we grew market share organically, but we acquired market share successfully in terms of buying companies. And we did a lot of acquisitions. At that point in time, post the merger, we had three billion, billion with a B dollars in cash on a balance sheet oh. at Lycos. We were Fortune 50 level balance sheet cash at that point in time. And this is a while back. That was a lot right, of money right, sitting right. there. And, and uh, what I feared about the internet did in fact happen. Things crashed down. And we were in a great position. We had a public equity and a ton of cash. We could have consolidated the market in a really big way 
but uh, my board wasn't as interested in doing that in terms of acquiring. I was interested in doing that. And uh, we had a disagreement and I said, I quit and went off and uh, this was over the course of a few months. It wasn't a one day impetuous right. time. I, I said, I quit. If, uh, I said, we're missing a massive opportunity and left. And on the day I left, uh, I announced that I was joining Highland Capital. And I've been here now for going on 21 years. Nice. So I want to go back to your uh, USA Network story, Bob, because I want to drill down on one thing. And I always tell people, uh, you know, uh, it is always very interesting for academicians to engage in what would have been kind of uh, speculation, if you will. Because when I read it as a lay reader from the outside, that was an acquisition that made a lot of sense, the strength, right? I mean, USA Networks had great uh, media assets, you had great assets. Uh, the synergy, I think, would have been explosive, if you will. So again, I'm probably putting you in a very uh, unfair uh, uh, thing here. So what would have been, I want you to <laughs> you know, speculate, you know, if that had gone through. Yeah, I mean, really, who knows? I mean, I, I look back with a sense of ego and say it would have been an amazing company and powerful and big, would have dominated commerce. All the all the commerce assets we yeah. had would have been just hard to compare against. And at the time, by the way, if you go back, this is 2000. I mean, yeah. Amazon was still, most of the world said Amazon can't survive. So yeah. internet commerce wasn't clear yeah. and we would have been a leader in it. So I, I, in addition to powerful search technology. So I think it would have been a, a really compelling business. Uh, I would have run it. Barry Diller was going to be a great ally. I had huge respect for him as an individual and a businessman. He would uh, would have been our chair, and I think it would have been something compelling. But at the same time, and I'm urging with Telefonica, I think if we went out and and acquired a lot of assets the way yeah. you know we looked to do, who knows what would have happened there. So uh, it's easy to look in the mirror and say what could have been. But uh, and at the same time, if we stayed independent, I mean to be self-critical. You know, Google came on the scenes mostly after us. If we stayed independent, maybe today it would be Google. So you, you just you just can't you just can't tell. But you know, it all worked out. Our shareholders were happy. Our employees were happy, and um, it's hard to look back and second guess. Absolutely. So now you move to uh, Highland Capital, where you are general partner right now. And I'm I'm very curious about this part. You probably had the entire world in a platter in front of you in terms of opportunities. You were a a rock star CEO. Uh, you had taken a firm past us to IPO. You had uh, uh, sold the company at uh, record levels, etc. Why venture capital and why not, uh, you know, CEO chairman of a, of a conglomerate? What made you make that switch? It's interesting. It's a great question. It's one that I, it's one that I ask myself sometimes uh, today, yeah. but. Um, a lot of things, but for one, when I was leaving Terra Lycos, the time I was leaving, um, um, I wasn't comfortable, just my, again, my ego, I wasn't comfortable saying I resign and I don't have that next job. So I was talking to Highland right. for a couple of months before I resigned and, and wanted that place to be, but I really didn't have any intention of staying at Highland long term. I came in there and very consciously chose a role called venture partner, which implies that I'll make some investments, but don't look for me to be doing this a couple of years from now. And got in there, and there, there was, when I got inside there initially, initially for a short period of time, there was a quality of life event in the sense that I was, every waking moment I had as a CEO, it was the job. Yeah. And I, um, I missed birthdays, missed anniversaries, uh, not seeing my kids grow up, and I said, I want to smell the roses for a few months and, and be around. And right. in venture, I'm not suggesting venture is hard work. It's really hard work. But, but it's a business that at the time, it's changed a little bit, but it, it came to you. The companies that were looking for investments would come to your office. Again, that's evolved. It's, it's really not that way anymore. And, and I could manage some lifestyle. But then when I got there, uh, I said, boy, this is a, a new business. One of my partners there is a longtime friend. We've been together now in multiple careers working for 35 years. He and I were at Lycos together. He and I were at Wang together. And so I, I like my partners as professionals and as friends. And I said, boy, this is stimulating. I'm not growing a company directly. I'm not, I'm not the CEO, but I'm, I'm part of its growth. We're building companies together. 
right. with these management teams. And I said, this, this is really great. And I made a couple of investments and I said, boy, I, I really like this. And, and I guess um, I was uh, drinking from a fire hose and learning a new industry. And I said, boy, this is, this is really great. And I, I really enjoyed it. So I, I guess, um, I mean, it's hard to say this, but again, regrets of, you know, I have few, but, but probably at that point, I was young enough. If, if I could back up the clock now, I'd, I'd never do this today, but if I could back up the clock and say, I'm, I'm 40 years old, would I, would I take another CEO job versus jumping right into venture? Probably. And delay the venture move for another 10 years, but, but it's been great. And, and it's been great, but, uh, you know, I, I love venture capital, but I love being a CEO more. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking. You know, but let me, you know, you touched upon this, Bob. You talked about how venture capital has changed in the last two decades that you've been uh, uh, there. Uh, it's very interesting. You have actually seen the evolution of two major industries in the US, you know, venture capital and uh, the computer industry. But anyway, um, let me, uh, ask you now. I see that you are into uh, uh, SPAC. So I want you to help us understand the evolution of uh, the venture capital industry over the couple of decades. You know what has changed. What what is happening right now? And I see a lot of movement uh, towards SPACs, etc. And I was uh, very glad to see you also go into that space. So could you elaborate on this? Yeah, you know, a, a lot has changed. I mean, back, um, I don't know, 30 years ago, the idea of you being a, a, a startup employee, right. the general mindset would be if you're a cocktail party and say, I work for a startup, people would say, no. Yeah. And they'd be, be behind their breast, they'd whisper and say, oh, too bad he can't find a job or she can't get employment. And right. That's why they're at the startup. So people didn't think that way. Right. I mean, the, the startup CEO wasn't the rock star that they are uh, right. today. Yeah. And, and venture was really, uh, and the idea of a big venture check was a million dollar check. I mean, now it's a, it's a tiny seed investment. Right. There wasn't the, the amount of capital and there wasn't the innovation to the powerful levels that there are today. There wasn't the funding to get businesses off the ground today. And of course that's exploded. There are venture firms just everywhere. And it's seen, it's seen a, a lot of different industries develop. I mean, we mentioned what we were doing, which was the, the media offering that we had, but just look at the, the internet businesses that exist today. It's so many different things that are, that are household names today and all the things that we buy online and commerce that we never would have purchased and the and the and the on-demand services like uber and airbnb and others that exist out there and just so many things that are and how we pay for things with paypal and venmo and others and how we bank and everything has just changed and venture was along for that journey because venture capitalists financed virtually every one of those businesses not us but venture capitalists financed just all for all of those in fact today stands for Special Purpose Acquisition Corporation. We launched one with uh, a couple of my partners at Highland and a, a third person joined us from Goldman Sachs. It's a uh, Highland vehicle, but we did it not fully within the confines of Highland. It's a great Highland uh, product, but we did it, um, jumped out. So I'm still a general partner at Highland Capital, right. but at the same time, I'm a general partner in the SPAC uh, separately from Highland Capital. And what a SPAC is, it's a, it's a new way of bringing a company public. Right. And it's funny, you look at, you know, why does a company use a SPAC today? I, I think that there's, I think we'll look back uh, in a number of years and say, why did a company ever use a traditional IPO? And I, I could be dead wrong on this, but why did a company ever use a traditional IPO? Yeah. Because with a SPAC, there are so many things we, we, we can do. We get to know our investors early prior to the offering. We have price transparency prior to the offering. We publish an S4 instead of an S1, which means we have a collaborative right. conversation with our investors prior to the offering. So many things that a SPAC allows for that a traditional IPO doesn't. And generally the company raises more money for itself rather than into the coffers of an investment bank. Yes. Uh, and it, there's a big something called an underwriter's discount that when a company goes public with a traditional IPO where the first trade is generally uh, well above the IPO price, which means that money goes to yes. Wall Street. Uh, with a SPAC, that goes to the company. So we think we're at the forefront of something that's that's a movement yes. as far as how companies go out. But again, you know, I've been right about some things and been wrong about some yes. things. And and ask me in ten years how this plays out. 
In fact, when I first read about SPACs, that's exactly what struck me. Why did companies go the traditional route that is so expensive, uh, not, not, not just in terms of uh, resources, but uh, it also, I think, protects the investors, right? I mean, when you think about the WeWork, the Barkle, et cetera, it would have never, I think, happened, or the chances of it happening through a SPAC would have been very, very, very limited, correct? I think so, probably. You know, why, why does someone do it? For one, it's what we know. So yeah. we're, all creatures, we're all creatures of comfort. It's the way the world has worked for forever. SPACs were an outlier. SPACs, SPACs have been around for a long time. Yes. They weren't used. They, they've been historically used for companies that were somewhat broken or damaged and didn't have the traditional IPO path available. That's changed over the last few years, but that's the way it had been historically. And people didn't know. And there's this sense of, of aspiration for a CEO that says, hey, I want to stand there and ring the bell yeah. on, the floor, on, the, on the podium of the New York Stock Exchange. So there's a, there's a powerful piece of it that says, this is what you're supposed to do. Yeah. And that, that drives a lot of folks. And the entire investment banking community is driven in that direction. So when your bankers, the important part of the process are dealing with the CEO, they say, hey, don't forget the traditional IPO. So it, it's still a, a big piece of it. And there'll always be a place for that, but I'm clearly a believer in a SPAC and thinks, think that's the way to go. If I was running a company right now as the CEO, it would be in looking to be public, it would be all SPAC for me. Okay, terrific, uh, Bob. So let me ask you, you are a, a legendary venture capital investor. What do you look for in an entrepreneur? If one of our students comes to you with an entrepreneurial idea, beyond the concept, what is it that you're looking for? Uh, passion, fire in the belly, drive, spirit, belief. Um, that, that's it more than anything. When, when we invest in something, we think about, uh, in this order, we think about people, market, product. We yeah. look for, uh, for fire, passion, right. conviction, belief, uh, confidence. Uh, when we invest in a company, the, the criteria we look for, first, second, third, people, market, product. But without dealing with all of that, we look for great people with, that can build great teams and are just really great leaders. And that's what we think about. So what I look for, great individuals, and that's so subjective. Uh, who's great for me may not be great for you, but someone I think I can bond with. And when I invest, I'm in, I'm, my investment period is long. I mean, as a venture capitalist, my average hold is probably close to 10 years from the wow. time I invest to the time I see liquidity. Wow. So I, I will say to entrepreneurs all the time, prior to the time that we uh, negotiate a term sheet, is that we're going to be in the foxhole together. And separately from my money, you know, we need to get along. And not every two people get along. It's just reality. So we want to be sure the chemistry is right from me to you, but equally so from you to me. And if I'm not the right person for you, run away from my money because there is the right person for you in the marketplace. Right. Go find that person because the money will be a commodity. It's how we work together and what we bring to the table that's a differentiator. And that, that's really important. So I look for the person that understands that. Great, great advice, Bob. So I want to go back to a point that I made earlier. In your commencement address, you told our students, you let up, you lose. What do you mean by that, Bob? Hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's uh, been my mantra for, since I was a kid, since, you know, since I was, uh, I, I don't know, since probably after my parents died. That, that says that, you know, life is hard, not a bed of roses, it's always a grind, there's always more to do, no matter where you get, there's this little extra that has to get done. Complacency is, is dangerous that you have, and um, you need to be applying yourself. You need to be out working, out hustling, out maneuvering, and, and just applying yourself, whatever you're doing. And that says that same passion that I talked about that I look for in an entrepreneur when I invest is what it's all about in everything that we do. It's being willing to do that. And, and part of what I saw with this, there was a really uh, great speech that I was motivated by that you probably are familiar with uh, called Man in the Arena. Man in the Arena by uh, Teddy Roosevelt back in 1910, he gave us in, in Paris. And to paraphrase the speech, it says, uh, you, you have to get in there and fight. You have to be willing to have the blood, the sweat, the dirt, and, and really be willing to fail, be willing to have, suffer disappointments, be willing to always struggle, but, but to persevere and take yourself over that hill, over that mountaintop, and to ultimately succeed and prevail. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. But what's most important is you're trying. 
most important is you're giving it your all and saying, I can do that. And you let it be loose, paraphrases that. I was at an event the other night, it was just astounding to me because an individual was quoting from that same man in the arena speech that, that I've always found, found so powerful, but that's what it is. It's, it's just getting the arena. And, and for that, to me, you get major applause and major respect that you're willing to step in and give it a try. Whether you win or lose, so much of that is fate. Yeah. We can't control all of that. I've been, I've been uh, lucky in my life in so many ways. Um, the things that have worked have had my challenges, but I've been lucky in things that came together. But I've always been willing to step into the arena. No, that is terrific advice, Bob. And uh, you should trademark it. You let up, you lose. <laughs> so. I, I did have a trademark for a while. I think it's ex expired. Oh, that, uh, yeah. I, I, wrote a, I wrote a book many, many years ago. Uh, called Speed is Life. I don't think you can even buy it anymore, but I wanted to name the book you let up, you lose, but my publisher was convinced it would sound like a self-help book and, and uh, <laughs> talked me out of it. <laughs> Terrific. So coming, uh, this is going to be uh, uh, my last question, Bob. So uh, you have been a community leader. You serve on a variety of boards. You, uh, knowing you, I know we've had this conversation, you shy away from publicity, et cetera. What is your advice to our students? Because one of the things we try to uh, instill at the more McKim is not only should you be great alumni, but you should also be grateful alumni and you should give back to the community and be an integral part of the community. So what would your advice be to young students about community mindedness? Well, community means a lot. I mean, community is philanthropy. Community is paying it forward uh, with others. Uh, community is being willing to listen. And, you know, it's, it's really important. I mean, I don't know if I'm the best at that, but I think about that all the time. I'm, I'm, I'm active uh, in a number of different levels. There's a lot of organizations that, I, that I'm involved with, it, you know, many different. But, 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 but taking, you know, you mentioned philanthropy. Taking philanthropy and, and putting that aside, which is important, uh, really important. Yeah. But putting that aside, I think we can all think about how we you know, we pay it forward uh, um, and how we make a difference right. with others. Uh, one of the things that I talk about often is creating magical moments. Right. And that's when we interact with others, no matter who they are. It's not just the person that I think can do something for me someday. Yeah. But creating magical moments is that hand that I shake for the first time. How can I make that impactful when I say hi to someone, I give someone advice, or I'm willing to take their phone call in the future. Uh, I mean, I never give an address without giving out my email to folks that are there and saying, reach out to me. Now, that's not to suggest that every person that reaches out, I can take a meeting with. I just can't. There's not enough hours in the day. But I'm always trying to do that. And, you know, if you look at students, I, I can't tell you how many thousands of students I've met with over my career that have gone on to do some pretty great things. But it's being willing to involve be involved, give some advice, give your thoughts, be critical. It's not, you know, it's, it's not always to say, oh, isn't that great what you're doing? It's to say, that's the silliest thing I've ever heard because, you know, that can get people on a great path as well. But, but it's just being willing to be part of, of what this world becomes. Yeah, no, this has been a terrific, engrossing and enlightening conversation, Bob. There were lots of magical moments in this conversation and I'm sure our, uh, the entire the more making community is going to benefit from uh, a variety of magical moments that you shared uh, in this conversation. Bob, thank you. You are an amazing ambassador for the more making and Northeastern. And uh, thank you for all that you do. And uh, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you for sparing the time to give what I think is uh, timeless advice uh, to our community. Thank you, Bob. Very well, I, it, was, it was such a pleasure. And if it weren't for Northeastern, uh, as we talked about earlier in this discussion, my career would have gone on a very, very different path. May, may hopefully equally wonderful, but it would have been in so many different directions and been. And that was all my experience at Northeastern. Perfect. Thank you, Bob. Much appreciated.